I'm sorry, the second of our sessions uh, introducing Lisanne Havica from TU Eindhoven, Emanuele Naboni from KADK, Copenhagen and University of Parma. Uh, how is it possible to make the design process restorative? This is, will be basically uh, the main uh, thread of this uh, uh, session. So enjoy your session. Lisanne, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Carlo. Let me see. Share. Thank you. Um, so I will be moderating the session for working group two on the restorative design process. So just a brief introduction. My name is Lisanne Hafinga. I'm an assistant professor of building performance at Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, my focus is on modeling and simulation strategies and building performance. Together with Emmanuel, I edited the book Regenerative Design in Digital Practice. And I'm also a principal scientist system integration at the new IRIS Energy Institute. Um, this session, oh, this session, the working group two focused on the processes, methods, and tools for restorative design. Um, we had four subgroups that we divided the work in that worked very intensively together as well. Um, these subgroups focused on uh, big data in ecosystem focused design, so the different types of data sets that can be used to integrate a very a wide range of disciplines into um, the restorative design process. Um, the second group focused on urban climate change adaptation, so on urban microclimates and how resilience um, to climate change can be uh, improved. The third group focused on circular economy and environmental impact. Um, so it focused on life cycle thinking um, and how to integrate, for example, LCA into digital workflows. And the last group focused on human health and well-being, um, mostly targeting our indoor experiences, um, which we spent, I believe, they say 90% of our time indoors. So how we can make the indoor environment um, not just more healthy, but also um, to improve our well-being overall. Um, most of these topics will be touched upon today in this session. But before I continue, I would like to quickly give a shout out to our subgroup leaders who have been very essential in us achieving our goals. So it's uh, Catherine de Wolf, who will also be presenting during this session. I want to apologize in advance if I am not pronouncing names correctly. Um, Lucas Pinocchiaro, uh, Michaela Hamanescu, Clarice Blair de Souza, uh, Tatiana Kozic, Sergio Altamonte, who will also be presenting today, uh, Silvia Coppolo, Sil uh, sorry, Silvia Coppolo, uh, Giulia Sonetti, and Maria Beatrice Andriucci. I miss you already because it's been already a few years since our working group has been really, really active because we were one of the first working groups. Uh, but it's been a pleasure working with you and um, it's um, a strange experience ending Restore today almost officially. Um, I quickly wanted to give two highlights for me personally, and I think for most of us in working group two, um, the conference uh, and training school that we had in Malaga. So just organizing a training school didn't seem to be enough. So we had the conference sessions with uh, a wide range of keynote speakers from all over the world every morning and in the afternoon, the training school. Um, then the second highlight, of course, our book publication, Regenerative Design in Digital Practice, with over 60 co-authors um, contributing to the book, ranging from architects, engineers to scientists, um, both from academia and practice, and from a broad range of perspectives on regenerative design. Um, I'm proud to say it's been read online more than 15,000 times already. So it's uh, become quite a big success. And if you haven't read it already, you can download it via the Restore website. Just go to the deliverable section. Um, the three speakers that will be presenting during this session um, are Dr. Emmanuel Naboni, who will be presenting the 10 scales of adaptation to climate change. Uh, Dr. Catherine Wolf, who will be presenting uh, carbon and ecology within the design process and a case study. And Dr. Sergio Altamonte, who will be presenting um, human well-being via certification and tools. Um, so that brings me to presenting the first speaker or introducing the first speaker, um, Dr. Emanuel Naboni. Um, 
who to get together with me was uh, the leader of Working Group 2. He has recently started as a associate, or recently, the last year, I believe, started as associate professor at the University of Parma. Uh, but he is also still affiliated uh, at KADK in Denmark, where he had been working through most of the action. Um, um, his focus is on sustainable cities and combining architectural design and uh, innovative technologies, um, focusing on regenerative design solutions and how digital tools and digital workflows can be, be uh, adopted to create these regenerative design solutions. And he focuses a lot on climate change, both adaptation and mitigation. Together we edited the book uh, that was the ultimate outcome of uh, regenerative design and digital practice. Um, and he's also been an invited professor at ETH, uh, EPFL, um, Southeast University of Nanjing and the Architect uh, Architectural Association and UC Berkeley. Um, so, uh, Emmanuel, I'm honored to give the floor to you uh, to present your 10 tales of adaptation to climate change. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope uh, you're able to see my screen. All right, uh, uh, so today I'll try to uh, put in order uh, some of the findings of this uh, four year of uh, uh, collaboration uh, among um, uh, institution and university across Europe and worldwide. Uh, specifically in the working group two, uh, we had four lines uh, of investigation. Uh, one of these was related to uh, adapting uh, uh, the built environment to climate change in order to create um, favorable uh, condition uh, to uh, this um, uh, uh, major uh, transition. Um, and I try to uh, actually organize these uh, 10 scales uh, of adaptation of uh, climate change, each of which correspond uh, by chance or uh, more or less uh, in an organized way uh, to different um, uh, scale to approach it. Uh, the key message uh, that will be transversal to this presentation is that to uh, create an environment uh, which is temperate, uh, which allow for life uh, of human and other species, um, and that uh, minimize um, energy expenditure, uh, uh, it's necessary to think of strategy that crosses from the meso scale, from uh, let's say the territory, territorial scale, up to uh, the design of details, uh, as well as uh, uh, in the um, uh, creation of uh, devices uh, that helps uh, for um, uh, orient uh, personal uh, strategies. Uh, so I'll follow uh, this line um, uh, um, of uh, scale from bigger to smaller uh, in these 10 minutes of uh, speech that we are having together. The first approach is about uh, mesoscale. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, together with a, a series of uh, um, uh, uh, Swedish municipality, uh, where the aim is to understand what type of geographical or territorial issue uh, should be maintained or developed uh, in order to keep um, a temperate climate. Uh, this is particularly significant in Scandinavian countries where summer are suddenly very hot and where um, people and uh, mainly also buildings are not ready uh, to face such high uh, temperature. Um, as we can see here on uh, the first two um, uh, 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 squares, uh, we have um, uh, a part of a town facing the sea, uh, namely this town is called Stenexund. And what we have been able to track is uh, energy consumption of each of the building, um, as well as the temperature within the building. And this is what you can see uh, in dependence of the color. Uh, and we can see that some buildings consume more or less than others, as well as there is an evaluation of outdoor comfort uh, for a given time. We can see on the second chart, uh, what is happening um, a few years later uh, in 2050, uh, we can see that some buildings are basically maintaining the same type of instantaneous uh, loads for cooling, uh, whereas other have an increased uh, amount of energy required. As well on the site, uh, we can see how certain areas uh, are um, becoming warmer than others. 
So what is interesting is to do a delta, a delta between performance between 2050 and 2018, and this is represented by the last chart. So it's possible to track what type of buildings uh, will be performative uh, uh, and uh, climate resilient uh, in the future, as well as some what uh, ge uh, geographical areas, uh, uh, those that are exposed to the sea or those that are forest uh, or those that are exposed to certain stream, are securing uh, climate retention. This means that areas that are uh, bluer um, uh, are, um, uh, despite the reason a sudden and a major climate change, are able to retain uh, a, a, temperate, um, a temperate climate. Second scale of investigation is the uh, large district. Um, and um, uh, when we think about energy, uh, it's, it becomes a uh, key to have an overview of how to uh, prepare the building uh, for the future. And this can be, uh, for instance, addressed at um, um, uh, city level or district level. Uh, and this is a collaboration with the team of PFL, uh, Silvia Coccolo, uh, Dazaraden, uh, Mauri, uh, Pietro Florio, um, and Hader. Uh, we have made a couple of uh, um, uh, cost related publications where we discuss how, uh, if we implement uh, uh, Minergy, which is a Swiss standard for retrofit strategies, uh, there will be a big failure, especially when uh, it comes to summer. And what is interesting is that architecture that was built in the 70s or the 80s is actually uh, um, uh, more ready to the transition um, as the envelope as um, uh, a major exchange of energy uh, with uh, the uh, ex ex external environment. Um, and somehow uh, this uh, openness in terms of thermodynamic flows allows uh, um, uh, to uh, acclimatize. Uh, following in this uh, ranking of scale processes, uh, we have been working, especially in Malaga, as a, a supplement of the uh, a training school mentioned above. Uh, we have been working with uh, Tio Munken um, as well as uh, with um, uh, other um, uh, partners um, uh, in, in, um, in uh, other countries. Uh, and we have been uh, trying to understand how this changing climate um, is affecting uh, multiple uh, factors, uh, not only the, uh, let's say, the uh, most, uh, the one related to energy and um, uh, let's say outdoor indoor, indoor comfort, but also we try to uh, introduce the aspect of how uh, other um, uh, speeches or how um, uh, we are creating a thermal um, and visual uh, uh, condition as well as uh, we have um, a balance uh, between softscape and hardscape, uh, the four nature-based solution. Now this can be envisioned uh, in order to create a full regenerative strategies. Um, and this also correspond uh, to um, a journal uh, publication. So we're um, actually studying uh, future IPCC uh, climatic scenarios, uh, um, uh, looking at how, uh, for instance, agriculture can be uh, impaired, how other species uh, can be uh, 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 impair how biodiversity can be promoted or uh, impair um, as well. So this is an effort to extend the um, uh, the focus um, uh, to uh, a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And this is a good land for collaboration with other uh, specialties. Um, when it comes to outdoor, the space in between the building, um, especially with you dealt. Uh, and uh, other colleagues from Timonic, we have tried to um, understand uh, throughout um, measuring and, and, uh, and uh, going into the city, how different uh, pattern um, and configuration uh, running from, uh, let's say more dispersed uh, to uh, the first belt of the city to the historical center, in this case of Copenhagen, to other, a uh, new development, uh, for instance, uh, by the canal uh, from Ram Colas uh, or other uh, archistars. Uh, and what is interesting is to understand and observe how uh, historical certain uh, of, uh, very resilient um, uh, configuration uh, when it comes to uh, adaptation to future 
climatic uh, trend. And this is also as a high pedagogical value because this was uh, sort of also recorded. So it's a, a coupling of measurement and simulation. Uh, and this has some um, uh, influence of um, uh, some uh, pupils um, on the way that it was possible for them to understand um, uh, in an intuitive way the relation between uh, urban form uh, and climate. Uh, furthermore, together with uh, Taltec and NTNU, uh, Gabriele Robaccaro and uh, Francesco De Luca, we have been uh, working uh, for the city of Tallinn and other North European uh, um, settings to understand how this new trend of having tall buildings uh, can impact uh, local climate today and um, in the future. We have customized and built new um, uh, uh, let's say uh, workflow uh, where there is uh, an optimization, a computational optimization, as well as a physical uh, integrity of the model, which is uh, curated uh, by a different iteration of calibration. Uh, but substantially, it's possible to um, what we have been studying is different schemas for tall buildings uh, with some parametric configuration, looking. Um, uh, simultaneously at uh, what is happening in terms of energy within the building and within the outdoor. And what is interesting is that uh, even minimal um, uh, uh, changes into the array of building can grant uh, or uh, create uh, problems when it comes to outdoor comfort as well as energy. Uh, so one of the main outcome of this uh, work is that every project should always couple indoor and outdoor. Uh, because uh, it's a very delicate fine tuning between uh, indoor and outdoor uh, requirements. Narrowing it down it further, um, uh, when it comes to building form, um, this is again uh, a zoom in into the collaboration with uh, the uh, PFL team. Uh, what we've been observing is that um, uh, building shapes uh, uh, along with material uh, should be taken into account already in the planning phase because each shape is as specific as, as it happens in uh, nature um, uh, answer uh, to climate and uh, climate change and as um, and here we can see again instantaneous energy loads of uh, four iconic uh, building of uh, PFL campus and we can uh, immediately see how here there is uh, a different colors corresponding to the watt hour per square meter in that time of analysis. Coming to facade, uh, we have developed um, uh, um, a series of uh, uh, understanding um, of uh, and calibration and creation of workflow, uh, which are now shared for the community of uh, to the community of uh, designer um, and uh, company as Arup is using this uh, uh, that we made uh, share. With the uh, um, uh, share, and this allowed to, uh, for instance, uh, understand um, in a few uh, clicks, uh, since the recipe it's uh, it's already made, uh, both uh, what are uh, how each configuration of facade allow for indoor and outdoor uh, temperature to change. Uh, you may be surprised, but actually each design of facade gives a different uh, outdoor comfort uh, within the street. Uh, so the idea is to begin to conceive facade as climate giver also for the outdoor and, and fine tune uh, this balance to the level of details. Um, just to give you a rough example, this is a collaboration with the uh, Francesco Fiorito from Polytechnic of Bari. What we've been doing is to just try to change uh, small parameters such as the color or the emissivity and reflectivity of some facades. And what we are able to see is that just by doing so in a standard canopy, it's possible in summer uh, to, uh, depending on the location, and these are Copenhagen, Madrid, Brindisi, or Abu Dhabi, it's possible to mitigate the climate up to four degree in both season. So it's very important to do this type of um, uh, consideration as we can extend uh, the possibility of people to spend or spending time on the outside. Uh, and now um, a second step is to begin to investigate, um, and this is a collaboration uh, with Italian partner at the University of Camerino, uh, and Odysseus. Uh, uh, so this has all begun in uh, Cyprus uh, uh, in a visit to Odysseus of about a couple of months, uh, where we use um, uh, the uh, manufacturing lab of Odysseus and where Odysseus has prepared different type of shapes. Uh, and through uh, thermal cameras, um, uh, we have been able to understand how each shape uh, behave um, 
uh, um, uh, thermodynamically when exposed to uh, infrared uh, light. And this has been whole model and has calibrated uh, a series of uh, <clears throat> understanding on how different geometry, like we talk about modular facade, therefore, or non-modular, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, geometrically expressive facade, and we have been creating um, a sort of um, uh, diagrams that relates to what you generally do for indoor for energy and temperature consumption. We have a sort of discuss for the outdoor, how much energy would you have to supply in order to agree uh, um, uh, to reach uh, thermal neutrality according to uh, Universal Thermal Climate Index or um, other uh, set of standards. What is interesting is the geometry uh, can really um, have um, an impact. And uh, ideally, there are shapes uh, that um, uh, through the means of um, a short and long wave radiation, uh, uh, several exchanging can grant uh, a certain uh, type of um, uh, comfort. Uh, furthermore, other members of the action, uh, such as uh, Gian Piero Evola or um, uh, Costanzo, uh, we have been studying on retrofit, uh, uh, shrinking uh, more and uh, keeping talking about the envelope, uh, try to understand how it's possible, for instance, via green facades uh, as compared to traditional uh, configuration. And uh, uh, looking into, for instance, ventilated green facade versus uh, non-ventilated facade. Uh, but what we have been uh, trying to understand is how, and Lisanne is showing up, which means I have one minute or, or probably I had already used my time. Uh, but the idea is that each facade can give both indoor and outdoor comfort as well as energy expenditure. Uh, furthermore, I would like to uh, ring to the, uh, and this is just point nine and we'll uh, quickly go to 10. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, together with uh, uh, Jonas, uh, again, a construction member where we have seen and take four uh, existing buildings in Germany and um, Denmark. And we have looked at how they've been retrofitting according, for instance, to European normal passive standard. Uh, what strikes us is that when we look, and also Vahid Nick is part of this work, uh, recently published, uh, what we've seen is that if we look at comfort, I will not uh, uh, talk uh, too much about this slide because it takes some effort, but um, actually, if this building were not retrofitted, they would adapt much better to a future climatic trend. So we have to be very careful uh, when we follow European codes today, because doing good today will <laughs> mean um, uh, doing very bad uh, already in five to 10 years. Uh, so this is a, a major warning I would like to share in this presentation. Last but not least, we have developed several uh, human scale prototypes uh, of climate adaptation when look at the position of heat and cold receptor uh, within the body and uh, try to develop ideal boxes where in these boxes uh, we try to acclimatize uh, by changing mean radiant temperature or by changing uh, humidity and so on. Uh, and this has been uh, made in, in different locations. This is for instance um, uh, in Aftamagosta in uh, Chile in the Atacama Desert. Uh, where we have uh, sort of uh, created the unit uh, to be used by a single person, uh, try to understand uh, throughout uh, major uh, and large surveys what's the feeling, what's the reaction. So it's very also uh, important to understand how to address this um, as a final message uh, from the very large, um, from the very large uh, scale uh, to the fine uh, detail of uh, uh, human uh, physiology. Understand, understanding where the, uh, uh, how it's possible to discretize the human body according to um, a certain number of nodes. Uh, okay, I think uh, I finish uh, uh, my time and to be in touch, uh, just uh, uh, in Instagram, for instance, just uh, use Emanuele underscore Naboni underscore climate and uh, uh, we can talk more there. Thank you, Emanuel. It is time to move on to our next presenter. I work with Sergio Altamonte. He is a professor of architectural physics at the Faculty of Architecture and Architectural Engineering and Urbanism at the University of Louvain uh, in Belgium. His focus is on indoor environmental quality and occupant comfort, health and well being, human physi physio psychological responses to visual stimuli, uh, high performance building envelopes, and control strategies. Um, he is also the director of research at the Chair of Architecture and Climate. Um, and he has been a very valuable contribu uh, contributor to our working group because he was our expert on uh, 
basically indoor environmental quality and indoor aspects together with uh, An Angela Loder from the Well Building Institute. So I'm very delighted, Sergio, to have you here. As you know, we are running out of time a bit. So if you are able to squeeze a few, oh, sorry. I'll try my best. Time. I have what? I have three minutes and a half. Hi. Good to see you. See you next so time. You have, Bye. Ten, you, have ten, you have definitely okay. 10 minutes, but... <laughs> okay, I'll try <laughs> to do my go. best. I'll try yeah. to do my best. Don't worry. Okay, uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Lisan, thank you a lot for the introduction. Um, I hope you see my screen. This is the sentence of 2020. We repeat, I hope you see my screen at least 15 times every single day. And I will write it on all my uh, Christmas cards hoping that in 2021, everybody will see your screen. So um, human well-being by certification and tools. Uh, um, I want to start by a sentence that was said by Winston Churchill in 1941. We shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. The context in which uh, uh, Winston Churchill said these words were slightly different, but I think that these words make a lot of sense today. Uh, as Lisanne said at the introduction of this session, we spend uh, almost 90% of the time in enclosed uh, spaces. And we know as uh, we start from an integrated analysis approach of what are the conditions inside buildings that staying indoors is not necessarily healthy. It's actually quite an interesting thing. Since March, we've been forced inside from uh, obviously the pandemic situation in which we're living in order to protect our health. But actually, you know what? Uh, the fact that most of our building standards focus on single dose and steady state responses that we're still missing a lot of feedback, uh, transient and nonlinear relation over time, and the fact that we ignore that individuals can differ in needs, preference, and behaviors are such that effectively our experience of the built environment that characterize 90% of our time may actually be not a healthy one. Why? Uh, let's look, first of all, at what we currently do in, in the building practice. We, we focus a lot on energy, and rightly so, because buildings, as we know, use 40% of our energy, and energy, be it residential or commercial. However, buildings do not use energy at all. It is actually the people inside that building that consume or use, as a better term, that energy in order to provide for their comfort and well-being. So logic would say that if we could better focus on what we need in terms of comfort and well-being, we may actually then act in order to decrease our use of energy. But first of all, we have to say that those things may actually contradict with each other. So there may be actually very large discrepancies between what are the requirements, for example, for energy efficiency, then the transit conditions that user demand for their activities in order to, perfect, for example, perform an activity watching a screen, what drives their desire, so their satisfaction, and what they actually need in order to feel well and be healthy all the time. So energy, comfort, satisfaction and well-being may actually be different. But this is not something that uh, is at the moment yet uh, included in, in the standards. And the reason why it's not included in the standards is because comfort and well-being are actually multidimensional psychophysical and physiological contract, constructs. And there are very complex relationship between environmental factors and human systems that we've not yet fully characterized. I'm borrowing this image from the Dallas from the Well Standard, where you actually see the various different systems of the human body, the way in which those systems interact with each other, and the way in which different environmental system activates one or the other is still something that we are not fully characterized, that we don't really properly know. But let's start with comfort. We've been talking for, about comfort for about, what, 40 years, uh, starting from the 70s and the first studies of comfort, or the first studies, the studies of comfort from Ole Fanga and then um, uh, Fergus Nichol and, and on the adaptive comfort and so forth. And then, for example, in thermal comfort, we've reached the definition that thermal comfort is the condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment and is assessed by subjective evaluation. So an interesting word here, satisfaction, and then the other one is subjective evaluation. If you look at another standard, like for example, the comfort uh, definition in the SIBSI knowledge series in the UK, actually this is taken again. Uh, thermal comfort, it was there is broad satisfaction with the environment. This means that comfort and satisfaction are somehow related, but what is satisfaction? Satisfaction implies a state of mind that is driven by gratification from a need or desire as it affects or motivates behavior. So we have satisfaction and we had the gratification from a need or desire. And in the standards, we assume that when we have satisfaction, we reach comfort. 
However, this is a multidimensional process because if we want to achieve comfort, it means that we have knowledge of physical phenomena. We have to have knowledge of physiological process and we need to have knowledge of psychological and behavioral responses to increase satisfaction. But then my question is, can there be some situation in which we are satisfied, but are actually not in comfort? And the easiest thing that comes to mind is where we are in a swimming pool. It's 32 degrees, 90% humidity. We have a drink in our head, a beautiful mojito. So we have all of the conditions that actually are very far from what the standards would define a comfort, but we're still satisfied. Hence the reason why I say that the conditions that are conducive to a comfort may actually be different from the conditions that are conducive to a satisfaction. But what about well-being? Well, well-being, uh, there's a lot of talks about well-being in the, in, the, in the press. And sometimes well-being is confused with wellness, comfort, health, quality of life. And we have scale that measure well-being, but they may actually measure different things concerning well-being. Well-being is actually a multifaceted physical, physiological, social, economical, and psychological need. So there's very different dimensions of well-being that integrate hedonic, so feeling good, as well as eudaimonic, so functioning well dimensions. And we have to take care of the synergistic appreciation between the quantitative and qualitative relations that characterize uh, this, this construct. This is obviously also something that is difficult to translate into the building practice because of the complexity of the definition of well-being, but also because well-being and the conditions that are conducive to well-being change over time. But why do they change over time? Let's look at the human body. The human body is not a constant uh, machine, it's not something that runs always on the same level of fuel, and that actually does not produce the same effect with the same level of fuel. Here we have, for example, the visualization of a two-day cycle of cortisol, the stress hormone, melatonin, the sleep hormone we can call, and the level of alertness and body temperature. As we see, there's a fluctuation that is driven by what is called the circadian cycles and the way in which those fluctuations are related with the factors that enhance that fluctuations obviously changes over time. So obviously the challenge of well-being is in setting the proper goals in then measuring the appropriate indicators that can actually um, support those goals. And then of course, uh, make standards and codes evolve in support of that. For example, we can talk about the heat and well-being. If you look, for example, at the heat, the most of the time, our comfort actually look at this. We look at the 80% acceptability. We look at the neutral situation in which we can provide the habitability threshold. We don't look at enhancing the light, anesthesia, sensory space and biophilia. We don't look at the dynamic aspect of, of, of well-being. While on the other end, we know that thermal variability is one of the aspects that can actually enhance our uh, metabolic responses and drifting temperature that can actually um, um, change temporally or spatially can effectively be healthier. And this is something that, of course, we have to take into account. Even from a lighting perspective, we can say that the, the same kind of relationships exist because lighting is not only for view, lighting also enhances our circadian responses, lighting also enhances our metabolic well-being. So it's important that we have a variety of responses throughout the day, and that in this variety of responses, we also consider that rods and cones, which are the traditional photopigments, are not the only one driving our responses to the visual stimuli. We also have the IPRGCs, so the photopic luminous efficiency function is not the only only want to be considered when looking at the responses of the body in terms of uh, lighting stimulus. An example was actually uh, made in some post-occupancy evaluation I did a couple of years ago when in winter the occupant actually could tolerate a much higher level of uh, uh, glare than he had in summer. And the reason for that in winter, he still had not had any metabolic stimulation from the sun, so he needed to have that stimulus in order to feel well and perform well over time. So obviously all of this has to be translated into standards. All of this is actually slowly trying to enter the standards. For example, lead and bring among the many certification tools are striving to bring within the credit structure the, con the consideration of the announcement of well-being in order to promote the health of building occupants in order to respond to this complexity of dimensions that can actually enhance, enhance well-being. And then we know other um, uh, systems like, for example, the Living Builder Challenge and FitWell that enhance an evidence-based approach, enhance the measurement of proper indicators that can support the multi-construct dimensions of well-being in all of these various facets. And then, of course, we can also mention the well-building standard that in his 10 
new concept categories is starting to bring some new dimensions in which the indicators that are useful for the building, so the performance, for example, in terms of lighting, thermal, and acoustics, are not necessarily the same indicators and the same benchmarks that are, there, that are on the other hand, related to the support of the comfort and, of course, of the well-being of people. So in order to conclude, we have to have a much more comprehensive analysis of buildings. And I'm referring to this um, um, framework for healthy buildings that was promoted by uh, Joe Allen and uh, uh, Harvard uh, Chan Medical School uh, in, in the US, where you have a much more integrated approach in order to look at the consequences that a healthy building can have on um, people. So from a point of organizational management of buildings, sometimes saving energy may not necessarily the most cost saving, cost saving strategy because then buildings may end up costing much more in terms of the consequences that they have on the comfort and well-being of people. So it's important that when buildings are managed, these differences between energy, comfort, satisfaction, and well-being is always taken into account. Considering that humans are uh, much more complex than uh, uh, what a simple equation or a complex equation sometimes will do. Humans actually have a number of different uh, um, uh, needs and requirements over time and neutrally acceptable environments, which are what at the moment the standards seem to uh, go for, may actually reduce all the opportunities for physical, physiological and psychological stimulation that across the cycle of the day and the cycle of the season can effectively enhance our comfort and well-being. So dynamic variability may actually be an important element to take into account if we really want to promote health in the environments that we live for so long throughout the day and throughout our lives. And also taking into account that energy, comfort, satisfaction and health may not just require a narrow and static range of average conditions as we normally have. So the uh, call for action is uh, the importance of a continuous monitoring also of buildings and evaluation, which is also something that uh, we will talk about uh, this afternoon, because I was also uh, part of the uh, working group four on monitoring and post-occupancy evaluation of, uh, of buildings. So I'll follow up on this uh, at about four something this afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sergio. Um, we actually still have eight minutes for questions, which is only two minutes less than we planned. So that's not bad. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Catherine, Catherine, can you also share your screen? Uh, your camera, I mean. Um, so the first question uh, is for uh, Emmanuel Naboni. And maybe I might have something to add to it as well. Uh, the question is, uh, do you mean that buildings should not be insulated when retrofitting, Emmanuel? Uh, well, uh... Uh, in a way, uh, I mean that um, uh, it's important to uh, interpret uh, uh, what regulation prescribes um, and uh, uh, to, to place it uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, in a better frame, it's important to design uh, with the climate of tomorrow as the climate of tomorrow is uh, uh, already uh, changing uh, from here to here. Um, and uh, uh, insulation uh, uh, is, um, although building can be fought uh, with um, uh, other matter of uh, uh, regulation, uh, such as ventilation or contact to ground uh, and more, uh, but insulation uh, creates a barrier in the exchange from indoor and then outdoor. And uh, to put it simply is uh, like if we wear a sweater, uh, which cannot be taken out in summer. Uh, so we have to design this weather in a very nice way so that uh, so I'm not saying that uh, it shouldn't be used insulation, but it has to be designed uh, very well and uh, dynamically. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. My addition would be, of course, it differs a lot per climate as well. But even, for example, in the Netherlands, where insulation is traditionally very important, um, well, the current building code very much focuses, especially in retrofit, on the winter comfort, and there are actually absolutely no requirements for the summer comfort while overheating here is already becoming a very big problem. And over-insulating the buildings when retrofitting can definitely lead to uh, higher overheating problems in the summer. So I would say uh, it, Emmanuel and I both also work with parametric optimization uh, and those tools can be used to also optimize the building both for the summer and winter climate and for future climate. And that is really important to take it into account because uh, 
we don't insulate buildings just for a few years, but hopefully for a very long life cycle. Um, uh, and then um, I'm very happy that we had this one hour to briefly reflect on all of your wonderful work and on the topics that we focused on in working group two. And um, well, I look forward, I'm very happy to say, to collaborate in the future with you also beyond the lifetime of Restore. And uh, I give the floor to Carlo Battisti to continue the conference. Uh, quite a lot on uh, theory so far. So on processes, uh, how to uh, conceive a different uh, type of sustainability, how to manage the design process in a restorative, regenerative way. But uh, when it comes to practice, so when it comes to existing buildings, construction sites, operations management, all of these things. So how is it possible to make uh, also these processes uh, restorative and regenerative in the end? And uh, just passing the word to uh, Giulia Peretti from Werner Sober Green Technologies for moderating this session together with Kasten Druma from the Zurich University of Applied Science. Please let me also uh, welcome Paula Borin from New Zealand, given that uh, due to the time zone, <laughs> this is really demanding for her. Uh, so we definitely appreciate a lot. So uh, enjoy this session and um, put your questions in the questions and answers box and uh, have a really good time. Thanks a lot, Julia. So thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, I'm uh, uh, sharing my screen. I don't think you can see it. Yeah, we see your screen um, in the, the uh, view, in the slide view mode. Ah, okay, good. Then it's correct. Uh, do you see now in the full frame mode? No, not yet. You need okay. to click on the... Perfect. Now it's perfect. Okay. Yes. So thank you very much for introducing uh, the third working group of the Restore uh, Action. So uh, it's called Regenerative Construction and Operation. And I'm uh, uh, leading now a very interesting uh, discussion throughout the whole life cycle of the building. So my name is Giulia Peretti. I work for an engineering company in Germany. And I lead it together with uh, Carson. Uh, the working group uh, three. Uh, just to give an introduction on uh, what we are going uh, to uh, speak uh, about uh, in uh, this session is uh, indeed uh, uh, about uh, the implementation of uh, regenerative and restorative principles in the reality. So we uh, deal also with the question on how can a building be built and operated in a regenerative way how can be uh, regenerative principle uh, can be integrated in the construction and operation process. And all this uh, was uh, uh, intended to be to uh, push or to uh, make a, a, a paradigm shift from the business as usual to a regenerative construction process. And to investigate all these points, we started with the analysis of the whole life cycle of the building. So uh, considering that uh, the working groups uh, one and two uh, worked uh, on the theory on the concepts uh, and on the planning, we started with the procurement, uh, then moved to the construction, uh, operation and maintenance, and uh, finally with the uh, future life. So just uh, for a brief uh, introduction uh, in the topics of the regenerative procurement, uh, we uh, said that uh, or we work together to develop uh, the first step uh, toward the transition from regenerative uh, design vision and its uh, realization. Then we move to the regenerative construction and uh, we investigated which are uh, the measures that uh, can help uh, to the implementation uh, in the construction stages uh, of um, regenerative uh, principles. And to do this, uh, we investigated uh, uh, in particularly three topics, which are the materials, the technologies, and the tools. And then after the completion of the building, we started uh, with the uh, investigation of the operation and maintenance. And the topic in this part was uh, not only investigated uh, the traditional uh, energy demand and the operational cost, but also the facility management from a social and ecological point of view. 
And the last but not least step about uh, our investigation and analysis was about uh, end of life. And of course, uh, in a regenerative uh, um, mindset, uh, we cannot speak about end of life, but uh, after the uh, current uh, um, operation of the building, it starts a future life uh, for the building itself. And uh, all the topics related uh, to this uh, um, big um, theme, theme uh, are related, of course, to the circular economy approach and everything connected with the reuse uh, of uh, waste and uh, uh, the consideration uh, of waste at a uh, resource. This is, was a very um, quick uh, overview of what we've done. If you are interested uh, more in detail, you can uh, see uh, our uh, publication in uh, the Restore group. And we have a very nice publication uh, uh, about uh, all the topics uh, uh, I just discussed. And uh, before moving uh, to the presenters of today, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, who was involved uh, in these uh, four years of uh, work, uh, starting from our kickoff meeting in uh, Copper in 2018, up to the training school and uh, uh, today with the final conference. And of course, so the further work until April. But now I would like to introduce uh, the first uh, speakers of uh, our uh, session regarding the construction and uh, our three uh, speakers uh, uh, are going to uh, tell us uh, more about the actual challenges and opportunities uh, of the implementation of a regenerative and restorative approach uh, to the in the European construction uh, sector. So the, the presentation is uh, prepared by three people. Uh, Odysseus Kontovorkis from the University of Cyprus. He is the assistant professor and director of the research laboratory for digital developments in architecture and prototyping. Then the second uh, person who worked on uh, this topic and will present now is Paula Villoria from uh, the Technical University of Madrid and she is a member of the Building Technology and Environment Research Group. And she teaches uh, several construction and waste management uh, related subjects uh, at the University of Madrid. And uh, the third person is Blerta Bula. Uh, we already heard her in the first uh, presentation. And uh, Blerta is a researcher and architect at the Department of Architecture of the University for Business and Technology in Pristina. And she also works as a consultant for many uh, Euro European uh, projects with a special focus on construction and energy management. So uh, I will give so now the screen uh, to Paula for the first uh, presentation. Uh, we, we, we are hearing some background uh, noises. So if you're not uh, speaking, please uh, uh, mute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Um, yes. OK, Perfect. let me. Um, Um, yes, perfect. We can also see your screen, Paula. Okay, let me see. Can you see my full screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, one second. Okay, now. So, well, thank you, Julia, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as Julia said, my name is Paula Vigioria, and I will explain some of the results that we um, developed during the working group three. And, uh, well, this presentation and the results uh, were done and developed uh, together with my colleagues, Odisea Zamblerta. Um, we have divided the presentation into uh, five parts. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction explaining uh, small aspects regarding regenerative construction in order to state the aim of our presentation. And I will then continue explaining some methods that we used uh, and the main findings and conclusions obtained in our, in our work. Um, the current concept of sustainability is not helping uh, currently to solve the environmental problems caused by the building construction. 
And that's why immediate changes are required. Um, today, the level of sustainable measures in the construction industry varies substantially from one country to the other. And in some countries, they are currently shifting from implementing like what we call like less bad strategies to a more positive net environmental impact by means of implementing regenerative sustainability materials, technologies and tools throughout the whole life cycle of, of the building from the bidding pre-construction stage covering all the way through to the second life of the building. So in this sense, uh, we wanted to know about the current picture of regenerative sustainability in Europe. What is the implementation of, in European building projects of these types of materials, technologies and tools? And this was the aim of, of our work. Uh, for this, we conducted a survey in order to analyze the level of implementation of sustainability regarding the building materials, uh, technologies and tools in different countries uh, of Europe. So uh, the survey was therefore uh, structured in several uh, parts. Uh, we obviously consider the three items we were looking for, which were materials, technologies and tools. Plus, we included a general information section in order to collect information about the respondents. Um, for the section of materials and, and technologies, we asked uh, the respondents uh, to know, we would like to know their use of traditional advanced and emerging materials and their implementation. Uh, for the materials, traditional materials, we were, um, we define it as uh, the current uh, materials used as stone, reinforced concrete, gypsum, plaster, uh, ceramic bricks, and, and so on. Those were the traditional materials. The advanced materials, we included like prefabricated materials. They, this means uh, plasterboards or precast concrete, and also sustainable materials uh, such as recycled materials or bio-based materials. Uh, the emerging materials, we uh, define them as uh, like uh, materials capable of improving the indoor or outdoor air quality or also self-healing materials or phase change materials. Those were also included in this, in this aspect. Uh, for the technologies, uh, we consider uh, traditional technologies, the current, the most commonly used concrete mixer, excavator, tower cranes. The advanced technologies were uh, more focused on computer aided design, uh, building information modeling was also included in this, in this category. And also uh, emerging technologies, we were uh, thinking about Internet of Things, augmented reality drones, 3D printing. So we, uh, we wanted to know to what extent the, the respondents used uh, these types of materials and technologies in their building, in their building projects. Uh, and also we wanted to know in which stage of the construction process, if, if they use them in soil improvement, foundations, a structure, facades, interior partitions and finishings. And at the end, we also asked them uh, which were the main barriers to implement these emerging materials and technologies. Uh, for the, um, the section about tools, regarding the tools, respondents were asked uh, to identify the most commonly used construction standards and certification system for the different types uh, of buildings. Uh, well, the survey was uh, sent, uh, it was an online survey sent to more than 150 professionals covering different construction agents, and we received a total of 74 positive responses. And uh, well, the results about these responses, uh, I will explain now. So from the, the responses that we received, you can see on the, on the graphs, that only a small number of respondents, uh, they, they are marked in, in green, usually implement emerging materials and technologies during the execution of each construction element. Uh, the vast majority, it is represented in, in a red color, never use these types of materials and technologies in their professional activity. Um, those who have used emerging materials and technologies for new constructions were mainly used in commercial or iconic singular buildings and also in residential buildings, both for the materials, where you can see the graph on the left hand side, 
and from the technologies where you can see the graph on the right hand side. Uh, furthermore, uh, the respondents were asked to identify which of the five building construction stages uh, was easier to implement or use these emerging and innovative materials and technologies. And results show that the majority of respondents consider that the building facade and the finishings as the building's activities were emerging materials and technologies can be easily implemented. Um, in addition, emerging technologies uh, can be also easily implemented in the execution of the building uh, structure. Uh, we also explored uh, the barriers the, um, and saw that the lack of, of training among construction stakeholders and the lack of knowledge of the existing emerging materials and technologies were the main barriers identified uh, together with the high cost of these materials and technologies. Um, regarding the tools, results about uh, the implementation of different tools, we saw that the most commonly uh, used construction standard during the construction of residential, commercial, industrial and iconic building was Eurocodes. And the most commonly used certification systems are the local ones of each country followed by the uh, LEED certification. Um, we also wanted to explore some differences between each regions, between each country. Uh, therefore, we saw that some results respondents from the southern of Europe used uh, usually Eurocodes, while countries from the no northern and western Europe prefer ISO standards. And we also noticed that uh, the most uh, uncertified buildings were mainly located in the south of, of Europe. Uh, as final conclusions of, of the results that we obtained, uh, we can say that in general, regenerative sustainability is currently poorly implemented in Europe. Um, those materials, technologies, and tools which are capable of improving the well being of the society are not commonly implemented, mainly because of the lack of knowledge, uh, the lack of uh, training among construction stakeholders, and also the higher costs of these uh, materials and technologies. Therefore, there is an urgent need to help promote the use of these regenerative sustainability strategies, and uh, they can be addressed uh, by using different recommendations, for example, seeking uh, the government's commitment to promote the use of uh, more advanced recycled materials or emerging regenerative materials and technologies, as well as the implementation of construction standards. Uh, also uh, focusing in, in an increase of awareness and uh, knowledge among construction agents regarding the existence of these uh, tools, technologies and materials. And uh, also the relevant training to use these emerging technologies and materials. These are um, the three main key issues that uh, should be necessarily addressed. And finally, uh, we cannot forget uh, the importance of involving and committing all stakeholders to implement regenerative materials, technologies, and tools uh, in order to bring the construction industry to uh, closer to the regenerative uh, vision. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I think we, any questions we will answer at the end. No, Julia? So thank you very much, Paula. Indeed, we will have at the end of the session also 10 minutes uh, to discuss uh, uh, the question of the uh, public. So now uh, I will go to the next uh, presentation and to the next speaker. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, so the next speaker, which is, uh, as mentioned before, also the vice leader of the working group three. And his name is uh, Carson Drumann. And he works at the Institute for Facility Management of the Zurich University of Applied Science. And he is uh, currently uh, the head of a real estate management competency group.
uh, in uh, many of his uh, projects and in uh, his research, he uh, addresses uh, issues relating to sustainability and uh, digitalization in the real estate uh, industry. And in the presentation today, uh, Carson will give uh, us a, a, a regenerative perspective of uh, operation F man and maintenance of building and uh, uh, about the investigation of measures uh, for a more sustainable and regenerative uh, facility management. Thank you, Carson. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. <clears throat> so let's uh, share the screen. <clears throat> That's my presentation there it is sorry <clears throat> That's my presentation note <clears throat> So uh, hello everybody and um, before we start uh, um, I really have to say uh, thank you very much Julia for chairing this working group three over the last four years this was quite an effort uh, great job uh, well done thank you very much. <clears throat> I have the pleasure to um, talk about a couple of minutes, talk about the uh, sustainable management of the built environment um, for the next couple of minutes. Thank you very much for the nice introduction um, as well. Um, in practice, we are talking about uh, the discipline of facility management these days. Um, we have the, the, the design and the construction and the phase of use and operation, and the discipline dealing mostly with the uh, operation and use phase uh, of, of the built environment is, is the facility management discipline. And it's mostly seen uh, as a supporting um, business uh, for the core business of organizations. This is in the, the industrial um, definition. And uh, it's only the core business. Why it's only the core business? Um, we, have, we have been able over the past couple of years to show the, um, the head of the company that the FM um, department can give added value to the core business and so on. So this is not not uh, to be discussed, but uh, what the FM is a little bit missing or slightly behind the development uh, these days is uh, that the corporates are going moving towards their ESG, um, their sustainability policies and facility management has to speed up to um, um, deal with these uh, new um, uh, requirements coming from from the corporates yeah. and uh, what what's the kind of a barrier in facility management these days uh, this is uh, some kind of a silo thinking not only in facility management it's still um, uh, the the fact uh, in the design and in the construction phase and there are um, yeah, some kind of barriers between these different uh, disciplines and, and phases um, and um, but we see a, a shift um, in, in the ni a nice development that uh, these barriers um, um, are getting uh, yeah, lower and lower and over a couple of years, but it's quite uh, too, too slow, this development. <clears throat> uh, what's an, another um, issue is uh, that uh, if, if people talk about uh, sustainable building operation these days, uh, they mainly talk about the ecological part and especially um, they talk about energy savings for heating, for cooling. That's, that's quite okay, but it's uh, far not enough. Yeah, to, if you take the, um, the integrative uh, sustainability uh, approach into account. <clears throat> But what you can see um, these days too is um, that um, the building owners um, are getting more and more interested uh, in sustainable facility operation, uh, including the investors uh, as well. And um, I'll come back to, to this point later, uh, but um, the, for, uh, for example, the Swiss Green Building Council we make in Switzerland, we um, are making the, the experience that uh, the building owners are more and more um, 
interested in to start the projects and to optimize the building operation in a sustainable way. <clears throat> the next slides um, on, can only be just an extract of all this work uh, that have been done in the working group three from all of these very uh, engaged uh, colleagues, um, for example, Suvi, Jelena, Ari Pekka, Asher, from all across Europe. And it's just an extract um, of the publications and contributions the working group has done over the past four years. So a summarize of the social target for, for generative facility management. Um, we heard lots of these aspects already in other presentations. So the social aspect um, is well addressed uh, uh, these days, but um, from my point of view, I would, uh, I would like to point out that um, this is a, the last bullet point on the slide here. This is one of the most important. Um, the communication. Communication is, is everything. Um, we are all be talking about taking the users into the, into the equation uh, in designing and constructing and operating of, of facilities. Um, this is nice, okay, and we can put it into these parametrics, into simulations and so on, but user behavior, use, user feeling during the use of, of spaces and, and rooms, um, this is not uh, addressed in a way that uh, will help the, uh, the overall goals of sustainability or regenerative uh, building operation these days. Yeah? So, um, we have to, yeah, not to educate, but we have to address the users, uh, explain them how, how to interact with their environment, what does this action and this action mean, and um, explain the consequences of their behavior. <clears throat> this has to be done in a more, uh, more efficient way, um, <clears throat> I would say. And, um, and another and the second important point um, to, to focus on is, um, and this is in these days, in the last couple of months, um, came, came up in a very fast and unexpected way. Um, yeah, the flexibility of the built environment for work and life. Yeah. It's, everything is mixed up today, people working at home in the kitchens, uh, the office spaces are empty. And um, so this shows us that we have to deal with these aspects so very, very, uh, deeply in the future and uh, we have to improve um, in developing uh, uh, an efficient mixed use and, and hybrid facilities for the future. And this uh, uh, is dedicated uh, also to, to the retrofit and the refurbishment uh, projects coming up in the future. <clears throat> Ecological targets, of course, there are a lot. Um, um, I, we already heard a lot of about energy consumption and uh, the uh, circular economy. This would be the next, the next big thing, uh, so to say, in the real estate uh, industry. <clears throat> we had nice presentations already about this um, um, aspect. Um, so um, <clears throat> I would like to to move to the next one, the economic targets, because. Um, the last couple of years uh, showed us at the uh, real estate market that uh, money, uh, it started with the credit crunch in, in, uh, in 2008, 2009 and the Euro crisis and uh, money was available in almost an unlimited uh, amount. So, um, and a lot of these investments have been done in the, um, in, in buildings. Uh, all across Europe. And um, so the investors <clears throat> are in the driver's seat at the moment, uh, have been in the driver's seat and are still in the, in the driver's seat. And hopefully what we will see is um, that example, uh, for example, um, financial instruments like green bonds um, will be used more and more in the future to do green um, investments. Um, this brings up uh, the, um, the approach of life cycle costs. Uh, we are talking about life cycle costing in real estate industry for a couple of years now, but uh, it's still far, uh, uh, it's less used uh, these days. So it had, and all these calculations have been done in a more in intensive way uh, from my point of view. And uh, this includes not only um, 
the the life cycle cost. It should be a life cycle performance analysis. Yeah. Uh, but it's, maybe there's some data and some uh, some experience missing. But we we should work on this. Yeah. And taking uh, all these digitization tools, software, sensors, and and all these. Uh, digital um, possibilities into account um, should be well balanced yeah um, but um, maybe building information modeling doing it in a digital way will help to um, to reach us uh, to reach the goals <clears throat> some kind of a, a summary um, this is a nice graphic um, taken out of our booklet I can highly recommend to you to study um, we have to to push um, that we get uh, this uh, this get this paradigm shift happen in the future um, in, in in operations and maintenance and use. Uh, we are coming from um, this linear economy. Catherine uh, already mentioned um, it should be a, a circular economy. Of course, um, we should use more data and information coming from sensors and from the buildings itself. To, um, to come to a more intelligent maintenance strategy, repair before replacement, of course. <clears throat> um, and we, what I already mentioned is, uh, um, don't, don't, don't see the people as passive users, take them into the equation of a regenerative building use and operation, make them to become active users, uh, interacting with their space, uh, being aware of the consequences of their behavior. And uh, yeah, which, what it makes more complex is um, that we should monitor not uh, isolated aspects, um, should be more integrated uh, uh, integrative indicators. <clears throat> Some kind of an, of an outlook. Um, regenerative design and construction is always nice, it, um, but we, it start a building use and operation starts with an um, with an, a clever commissioning. This is a lack in, in, in practice these days, so it should be est established user dependent uh, usage dependent uh, facility commissioning. Um, everybody's talking about digitization. Yeah, that's, that's nice, uh, but we should always carefully consider these high tech versus uh, low tech um, approaches because low tech um, hasn't, hasn't much higher maintenance costs and replacement costs in the future. So it's always um, to, to be considered or should be always considered. Um, what we will see in the future are new business models. I'm quite convinced um, workplace based as a service. Yeah, thanks to the pandemic, um, everybody has now a clear view on these um, challenges how to use the built environment in a, in a more efficient and more clever way. Um, and of course, we will see new business models coming up because the cars, the corporates are uh, started selling their, their, their real estate um, in, um, in the past and um, won't be won't be the next one, two, three years is some kind of uh, uh, green regulatory tsunami. Carlo mentioned it, it this morning already. It's the Green Deal of the EU, um, mentioned in or uh, established in, in, in December of last year. This will be a real tsunami of regulations, um, requirements, and so on, including. Um, including lots of um, um, regulations and the, uh, the affecting all the industry, every industry, but especially the real estate industry in the future. And so the investors will change their behavior and react in a more sustainable way as they have to. Um, and every stakeholder has to be aware of this uh, upcoming scenario. And um, one new approach for facility management, I guess, um, to break up the silo thinking is uh, stepping out of the perspective of a single building, think in urban districts, in uh, not to say smart, uh, smart cities, but start uh, um, breaking up the silo thinking on single buildings. Yeah. And uh, for all these, um, for more information, I can highly recommend the booklet already mentioned with case studies um, uh, carefully uh, selected and analyzed by the colleagues and much more information regarding this topic. Thank you very much for the attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Karsten. 
And uh, now of this session, we have uh, two minutes left uh, for questions. And uh, uh, we have uh, one question from uh, Daniel asking uh, to the something uh, um, to the presenters of the first presentation. So I don't know who uh, between uh, Paula, Blerta and uh, or Odyssea so will answer to this question. And the question is uh, regards to uh, your uh, survey. <coughs> And uh, there are many respondents, uh, about 30%, uh, who, who agreed uh, that uh, using such uh, uh, novel materials in facades. And uh, how would you explain this result? Maybe I can, I can answer. And if uh, maybe my colleagues, Odisea Alberta, would like to add something. Uh, but uh, I think uh, because I've checked uh, the, the presentation and also the percentage uh, that uh, Daniel is referring to uh, the 30% that respondents think or might uh, think that they would be able to incorporate these emerging materials in, uh, in the building facade. Not that they are currently implementing it. And uh, I think that's uh, the percentage that maybe I didn't explain uh, correctly in the presentation, but uh, it's, um, it's uh, the people that think it would be uh, more interesting to, to start or it will be easier to incorporate <laughs> this type of materials in the building for shade. And this, uh, I think it, it, it's um, uh, a conclusion that makes sense because currently the materials that are capable of absorbing contaminants are usually implemented in, in, in the facade, uh, absorbing uh, the outdoor contaminants. So that could be um, a reasonable uh, result. Um, also, we were discussing that uh, incorporating this type of materials in the shade, it was more, it was safer than and easier than maybe in other parts of the building, like uh, structural elements or, or foundations, which are um, more risky you know, to start implementing these types of materials. Thank you very much.